Takže dobrý večer, dámy a pánové. Vítejte v kempu v Centru architektury a městského plánování na poslední přednášce z našeho cyklu Urban Talks, než si na léto dáme pauzu. Dnešní přednáška je hrozně zajímavá, moc se na ní těším. Je tady s námi pan Chad Oppenheim z Floridy, z Miami. I'm going to switch to English, so he understands what I'm saying. Hi, Chad. It's nice to, nice to have you here. This is our last uh, lectures in the Urban Talks uh, sort of program cycle. Uh, Chad is a Miami-based architect. Uh, I just read that you won the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Interior Design. Congratulations on that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> he's going to talk about uh, the spirit of place, which is also the title of uh, the book that you can see right here, and then you can take a look afterwards. And I'm sure we're going to have it in the bookshop in the near future as well. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass the microphone to Chad. Welcome. Thank you. We could turn off the lights. Sorry. The, the Sorry. lights, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. I've actually never been to Prague. I have uh, extra pages in my passbook because we travel all around, but I've never had the opportunity of being here. And this facility is is so incredible. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, you know, we've become the most connected species that has ever lived on this planet, but we're also the most disconnected. We're disconnected from nature, we're disconnected from each other. Um, but you guys are very polite, I don't see anyone on their phone, so that's good. Uh, but you know, I, I see this happening often, even when I'm uh, on vacation somewhere, or somewhere really beautiful, people are like checking Instagram of someone else. So uh, our work is really trying to connect people with the place. And the architecture wants to really be of the place, and speak of the place. And I understand the word torar, which is really about how like wine can taste like a, a, a region and a place where it's, it's made from. So we want our work to actually be like that as well. Um, unfortunately, in the process of becoming so sophisticated as a society and a civilization, we've actually destroyed nature uh, and have moved further and further away. So it's our job for us as architects to really focus on how we can reconnect people with nature. Uh, I love this image of Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia. I had the opportunity of visiting this a couple of years back. And I think to me, this is something that has really resonated where for thousands and thousands of years, civilization has tried to control nature and manipulate it. But after we move out, nature sort of takes over. Um, after this civilization uh, left, the, the nature really th thrived and became really beautiful. And we had this paradise uh, that existed, uh, and we're getting further and further away from it. So we really want to allow architecture and, and planning and other things to bring us back in touch with nature before we get further and further away uh, towards this direction. Uh, we have the opportunity to work in some of the most beautiful places around the world. Uh, this is a project in Costa Rica. And the way that we look at, at, at projects is we begin to study and understand uh, the beauty of the place and celebrate that beauty. So here we begin to look at the atmosphere, the mist, the forest, the sky, the water, uh, the flora and the fauna. Uh, we also connect with the materials that are there. Uh, in this instance, it was lava stone, which is very abundant, but also old trees and, and old wood. And the idea for us was to, to work in a way that animals were camouflaged within their environment, where they become invisible, because more and more we're building more and more as a civilization, but in reality, we want to or at least we want to focus on how we can kind of blend in, build more with the land than on the land. And to me, I, I, I worked in New Mexico many, many years ago in university, and I always found these structures very interesting and, and really inspiring for me. This is uh, the Anastasi Indians uh, in, in this part of the Southwest in the United States. And what I found interesting was this idea of sort of architecture without architects, the idea that they were building these very utilitarian structures 
Uh, and they were building with the materials that they had at their disposal. They weren't importing stone from Europe. But this element is something really beautiful, how the architecture and nature can be harmonious. So that's what we're trying to do with, with our work, and hopefully we're very successful in that. But once the mist clears, the idea that the building becomes hidden in its environment. Uh, here you can see the shape of the building, purely derived from the topography that exists. We have a hard time as architects, and we're challenged by the idea of all these very dramatic forms. So for us, the forms are uh, arrive from this kind of notion of the site. So this is merely celebrating the contours. And for us, the dream is that the building would disappear, that it would be engulfed, similar to Angkor Wat, by nature and consumed by nature. Uh, it was a little hard to show our clients that there was nothing there, so we had to kind of make it a little bit more visible than uh, what would hopefully be existing. Um, and everything was kept on site. All the trees were kept, and we like to kind of work with the landscape and work with the trees. And this is the one building that is actually exposed uh, above on this peninsula, and it becomes like a temple to nature, uh, where it's actually aligned with the path of the sun. So from the left, you can see the sunrise, and then through the day, as the sun sets uh, over to the right, and of course the moon as well. But it's all about this idea of, of creating the, the least amount of architecture to create the most incredible experience, this heightened experience of connectivity, of connecting with the surrounding beautiful landscape. And all the architecture is sort of mixed, the cement is mixed with the local lava rock, so it really becomes one. And then here you can see the hotel kind of emerging out of the forest, uh, becoming one with the forest. So the rock that's underneath that, that's what the hotel is, is made up of as well. And here you can see the spa that's nestled in a little ravine, um, very invisible from above, actually only see some water. But when looking up from here, you can see the waterfall and how this building becomes one with the landscape. And it's all about this idea of connecting and, and doing what's essential. We felt that it wasn't important that people would come to Costa Rica to see architecture. You could see architecture anywhere. We wanted people to come to Costa Rica to, to really connect with the beauty and, and the, the essence of, of the spirit of that place. Uh, this is another project that we're working on right now. This is under construction in Bali in Indonesia. And I've had a tremendous love affair with this area, and we finally have had the opportunity to work there. I went on my honeymoon there about 16, 17 years ago. Uh, and in this case, we're actually creating a new landscape because one didn't exist. This was a hotel that we're tearing down, uh, and then we're building more nature. We're actually creating this terraced hillside that is inspired by the, the rice fields that exist all around the countryside there. But it's not only to recreate the nature, but it's to create these very heightened experiences that you haven't had before. The idea of these terracings and pools and gardens and all the units, all the, uh, ex the rooms are, have these incredibly heightened connectivity to th the beautiful nature that exists. Uh, on a project in Harbor Island, this is a, a little island off of Miami about uh, 500 kilometers away. And for me, it was all about the sunrise and the horizon. The project actually exists to look like it's been there for hundreds of years, perhaps. There's a tremendous history on this island. It was actually the capital of the Bahamas, and the British um, came here about 400 years ago and set up the island. So we wanted to use the local language that existed. So if you squint, the, the building looks something like it's been there forever. Um, and it's also basically just like a floating roof. Um, here you can see the same wood structure that you would find hundreds of years ago. So we're using that vernacular language to create something that is something new at the same time as being something old. And here you can see or, or barely see the entryway to the house. It's basically like a staircase embedded in the jungle. Once again, like think about Angkor Wat. Think about that relationship between nature and architecture and letting the trees emerge through the building, not to kind of cut down any trees, but actually to add more trees and add more nature. 
uh, but allowing the building to kind of be nestled and work more harmoniously with nature, and at the same time framing it in a very, very powerful way. So here you can see the, the jungle in a perspective that you have not experienced before. I was talking to, um, giving a talk like this in, in Miami with a lot of art collectors, and this very uh, famous art collector of modern art said, well, where, where's the art? You know, where, where do you put the art? I'm like, well, that's the art, right? So for me, it's the ability to kind of see things in, in a more powerful way and, and connect uh, to this beauty. Um, you know, standing on that site before the house was built, yeah, it's something very, sorry, very beautiful, but it's standing there with the house and letting the house sort of frame it really becomes very powerful. And how the building can really track the passage of the sun as well as the moon. So this is actually the moon on the equinox, perfectly aligned uh, with the opening. And what's interesting is that ancient civilizations actually were more in tune with nature than we are. Every time the sun would rise or set, it would be like, wow, that's like a you know, miracle. And we like take it for granted. You know, There's so much beauty out there that we, we just kind of are numb to because of that type of relationship to technology and getting further and further away from that connection to, to nature. Uh, this is very much inspired by the work of James Terrell. I find that artists are a, a big inspiration and James Terrell's work of really creating these minimal framing devices to look at the sky and see the passage of time. So here you can see the house at, at dusk with the, the glow off the ocean. And once again, the moon here, like no Photoshop. This is, you know, perfect uh, alignment. But it's always about this changing camp, you know, back to that idea of the art and the framing. Here you can see, you know, the sky and this ever-changing environment that is really very neutral. And if the architecture became very kind of elaborate and heightened, you know, I, I think about, I, I saw the incredible Frank Gehry building over there. And, and I always constantly think as, as we're designing, how can we create the most simple thing? How can we com create the most essential thing? Do the most with less. And that, that's what we're, we're trying to accomplish everywhere we work, whether it be in remote islands or in areas that are very urban and very dense. It's always about like connecting to nature, even in urban environments, uh, to really capture that essence of place, to capture that spirit of place. Because I feel that you don't need to do too much. And if you do, you actually take away from the beauty that's there. So here you can see the architecture is very traditional. It has deep overhangs. Many times when we work in places, we study the history of the architecture because before technology in terms of air conditioning and other climate control, people had to develop things that were more sensitive to that environment. Allow it, how do you create something that will create the most pleasant experience. And it's something that we take for granted, right? We're just like, we could just flip on the air conditioning, which I wish we would, it's a little hot in here, but uh, <laughs> at any rate. Um, so the idea is that how do you like get very sensitive? How do you get hypersensitive to these places? And here you can see like the deep overhangs of the roof, the sun shades over the window. These are things that have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, and we've really cap tried to capture the essence and try to capture the, the spirit of that place. Uh, this is another place that I've really fallen in love with, and we do a lot of work over here. This is uh, the city of Los Angeles. And uh, a very famous movie director uh, called me one day and said, you know, I'd like for you to do, do my house. And uh, this is for the movie director Michael Bay, uh, who does all these incredibly... Uh, powerful and explosive movies like Transformers, Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, uh, all these films, and they're, they're very high impact. And what's interesting about this site is on, on one side, you actually have the most incredible view of the city, while on the other side of the house, you actually have this very pastoral view of, of the country. Uh, and it sits over, uh, over the city and looks into the country. Um, I've been also very inspired, a professor of mine at, at Cornell, actually gave me a, a James, uh, I'm sorry, a Donald Judd book. And Donald Judd is another artist that I've found very inspiring. The idea that these objects begin in a very simple way to frame and give tremendous amount of relationship to the, to the natural environment. And they're very, very essential as well. There's nothing more than what is needed. 
That came into effect in a, in a project we did some years ago in the Turks and Caicos, where we created this basically a, a viewing frame for nature. It was aligned with, once again, the passage of the sun and the moon. And in this instance, we didn't create something that was contextual because there was nothing on the island. It, the island did not have any civilization that we were able to uncover. And in a way, we, we try to become like archaeologists, trying to, to find the truth on a particular piece of land. So Michael saw this house, uh, and he's like, well, I'd like two of them. Uh, this is actually uh, one of them. Uh, this is his master bedroom, and it floats uh, over this garden level with the skylight that you'll see in a moment. And the experience is something incredibly heightened. Uh, you don't need, I believe, like incredibly dynamic architecture to create incredibly dynamic spaces, incredibly dynamic experiences. And that's what we're ultimately doing. We're actually generating, creating experiences. So there's also this dialogue that we have with the notion of what's contemporary or modern versus traditional. And in a way, there's been this, this conflict between traditional and contemporary archi or modern architecture, if you will. And I believe like, I'm incredibly inspired by traditional architecture, by classical architecture, certainly driving through the city and understanding these things and the sense of scale and proportion, texture, materiality. These are not sort of curse words in, in the modern architecture vocabulary, and, and we think about them a lot, this idea of a sense of arrival, of procession through spaces. So this is like the entry courtyard into this house, and it sits over uh, a water garden, and then you enter uh, above, that's what it sits over, so below the water garden is some nice cars uh, from the Transformer films, and uh, it's sort of like you enter it like a, a bat cave if you will, but when you enter that main um, space, you have a central piazza where you're actually able to go in all different directions, out to the garden in the back, up to the second pod, uh, which is a, 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 what was known as the VIP master bedroom. I actually, uh, it was spoken to me by the client, like you could stay there anytime you want. I actually only got one invitation. Uh, after about 20 tries, he finally uh, allowed me to stay there. And then this goes up to the, the master bedroom, and that's that skylight that you see before. So everything is sort of organized off the central space. And then down below there, you go to actually a prop museum, as well as an incredible theater and some other bedrooms. Uh, this is a, a really special room. This is the pool cabana. And what's interesting about this room is that it actually has this window, which is almost the width of this, this room, and it does this kind of very special movement. And what was interesting is that no one could figure out how to do it um, easily. So Michael said that, well, let me have my prop people, the people who make all the sets and all these things, do it. And we're like, dude, this is a real building. It's not a movie. Uh, you know. So he was like, no, no, we're going to do it. So we tried all these different window companies, and then finally... The prop people came up with this really brilliant idea, which is that the window has these you know, very heavy weights that are probably you know, this big and weigh about 25,000 pounds, and there's two of them. And then in the natural state, the window actually remains open, and the hydraulic arm, which you see here, actually closes the window. So it's a very, very safe and ingenious solution. Here you can see the, the master bedroom above the living area. And what's important for us, too, is the tactile nature of these materials. We want everything to be very much the hand of the people who make it. I think in modernism, you know, getting away from the sort of sense of, of, of soul in materials, the, the sense of soul in technique, and everything here has a tremendous amount of soul in it. You could feel the hand of the person who created the, the plaster on the walls, the steel, uh, the woodwork. Everything has been hand done. And what's interesting about that is you, you could feel sort of the energy in the place. When you walk in here, the notion of scale and proportion and texture are really quite uh, incredible. And then here you can see the building perched over the city as well as perched over the person who's in charge of delivering the Pritzker Prize. So that's uh, one of the Pritzker's homes, which I'm sure we'll never get one because we overpower their house and uh, create this 
idea of the, the floating volumes uh, within the sky. And there, there you can see actually the, the two weights here in the closed position. So they actually slide down these tracks. Um, on the one time I did get the opportunity to stay there, I, I woke up early and snapped this picture of, of the pool, which is actually an incredible pool. Uh, it's about um, 80 meters long, actually, and it's on two different levels. And it cascades down these stairs, but it was actually off at the time. But I thought, to me, this is like what really expresses the idea of our architecture, where the architecture is non-existent, but the architecture has allowed you to have this experience of, of the water and the connectivity and the sky and this connection to Los Angeles in this very, very unique way of experiencing the city. We do a lot of work in, in the desert. Uh, the desert I find very inspiring. Uh, it's something that we're able to, to manipulate in, in very interesting ways. Uh, we were asked uh, by the Queen of Qatar um, to create a destination spa in her country, a place where people would come from around the world to experience wellness and there would be research facilities and other things. And we thought that was a very noble task uh, because you know, not many people want to go to Qatar, uh, let alone three hours north of Qatar in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we took this opportunity to see if we can create something that was invisible and powerful, very, very silent, but monumental at the same time. I, I kept thinking about you know, Egypt and the pyramids and creating something that would be civilization-defining uh, because they like to think big over there in Qatar. Um, these are some of the preliminary sketches. Uh, this is what the office kind of takes and makes into the architecture. So uh, we have an incredible team uh, in the office, actually, Beat Husler up top runs our office in Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Beat and I actually went to university together uh, at Cornell, and um, you know we've started working together about ten years ago, and and we have an office here together uh, in Switzerland. Um, but this is the sort of madness of the the sketches and uh, sort of what the people in the office have to in interpolate and turn into design. Uh, the project has the, the entire peninsula. As I said, it's about three hours north of, of, of Doha. And we wanted to create something that, that was nearly indeceivable in terms of what you can experience and what you can see. We didn't want to turn this project into Dubai. We didn't want to change it and make it palm trees and grass. We wanted to actually cer celebrate the, the beauty, the natural beauty of this naturally occurring landscape. So here you can see the peninsula, these are these research facilities. And while the structure is incredibly long, you can actually only see a small portion of it. Um, these are the facilities of, 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 these are like little villages. Well, you can see the size of a, of a car. Um, I've always been very, very inspired by, by cinema uh, as well as, as by artists. So for me, Star Wars and all these other places really become uh, tremendously inspiring and you know more subconscious actually uh, I didn't think of it at the time but then someone mentioned it once and they're like I think if you could see like there's maybe two suns here somewhere um, but you know these ideas of these subterranean villages we thought were, were quite interesting so only upon arrival do you see this structure and it almost feels like some sort of alien ship uh, it's actually a very, very pure geometry of a triangle. And then once you enter into there, you're in this kind of new universe, this new experience that you've never had before. And it's really about pleasure, about delight. We flooded the entire uh, landscape here by just opening up a little piece of, of, of earth because it's on the water. And by flooding it, we create this incredible experience. And here you can see the sort of one of the bridges uh, of the structure. It's only about four meters high, uh, and the whole element becomes sort of a structural piece. And in there, there's actually a, a spa. Uh, in the water, we created these beds of stone that begin to create baths within within the sea itself. So when the the tide goes down, they are um, they remain filled with water, uh, and the rooms have this very powerful connection to the place. Uh, very much, all the water is taken from the sea 
and salt, salty in nature. But it's really about connecting with the sky. It's about connecting with the horizon. It's about finding the power and the beauty in, in nature and, and seeing it and reconnecting and getting more primitive in a way. So here you can see one of the elements that's carved into some of those dunes. Uh, the center of the, of the facility is the spa. And it was very much inspired. I had the opportunity of living in Rome when I was studying. But it's sort of this fusion between the, the scale of, of the Roman baths uh, with the sort of light quality of the Turkish baths. Uh, here you can see a, a small film. So we had to produce this film after working on the project for a year. And you can see it's a, it's a very massive structure. Um, and then as you get sort of below it, you begin to experience the sort of disappearance of this very large sculpture. That's the open flood channel. And then when you're at ground level, the building, although massive, disappears. So we carve some slots. So you can see the sort of carving of these stone walls. And then the cement that holds, and the cement concrete structures are mixed with the sand. So everything becomes, becomes one. So it's really about the passage of time and how this, the sky and, and the overall experience can change constantly throughout the day and night. And then you enter upon the, the spa. And all the vegetation is actually native species that exists in the area. Interestingly enough, the, the queen was very, very particular about the vegetation and in fact, the renderers who helped us on this, this movie only had a certain amount of trees that they were using, and we, we submitted the preview of the movie, and Her Highness said that that's not the leaf structure of these trees that are Qatari trees. Uh, and, well, those guys didn't like to hear that they had to re-render all the, the vegetation. But, uh, but when you're the queen, you can pretty much do what you want. And then you can see one of the suites, uh, the inspiration of, of the sort of Arabic or Islamic courtyard with water, the garden, the center of the space, and then the connectivity to the horizon, to the sky. This is sort of the, the peak of the, the triangle floating out uh, over the gulf. And then you can see here the, the building as it exists, that's that space actually here. The center is the spa, and then that's all the rooms with the flooded channel. We have a fascination with, the, with these sort of sacred geometries of the triangle and very simple geometry. Um, in this case, this is uh, another um, project, this time in a place that most people really love to go. This is a a semi-private island also in the Bahamas. And in this case, we're, we're using all the rock that's here, which is a coral rock, which is a type of limestone. So we're, we're nestling in to this area. This island is also uh, sort of a native island. It's uninhabited. So we wanted to do something as, as low as we possibly could. So we, we found this moment here where we can sort of nestle the building, carve out some of the, the rock and then turn that into stairs. So using the rock and carving the rock, turning it into pools and, and stairs and, and using the rock again in the building and, and mixing it with the cement. But always creating that moment uh, for connectivity, for understanding the sky. This is another sort of triangle scheme that we've uh, 
arrived at. This is for a, a private home that's actually like a private resort, if you will. It's a about 7,500 square meter home uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, and the inspiration of this was actually the Alhambra uh, in Granada, uh, which is this, basically a, a palace fortress uh, that has all these garden courtyards. So here you can see the sort of powerful shape of, of the triangle, which actually just fit the site. These triangles are not purely fixations that we have with the three-sided polygons, but it's actually something that is always arriving at from the site energies that exist there. And then you enter here into this courtyard and then go into another courtyard and another series of gardens and other courts. So this is the, the entryway. Uh, it's a very low-slung home, framing views of the desert. Uh, and then this is the office, a uh, very large art collectors with this uh, fountain. This is actually a piece of sculpture that they owned. And then you can see that, that courtyard here, which is framing views of the desert. That's the wife's office. Uh, important to have two offices in every home. Uh, and then some sculpture that exists. But this idea of these notions of classical space, of courtyards, of covered loges, of breezeways. And then the main family area, this is the area that's sort of out um, in the back of the house, connecting to the pool. Very, very casual um, lifestyle experience. And, that, and we're oftentimes creating lifestyle. We're actually creating and generating these experiences. Um, on another project in the desert, we created a very simple circle shape. And that circle shape actually becomes a very large wall, about two kilometers long, that goes out into the, the ocean and becomes a pathway. Interestingly enough, the, the clients didn't realize that when tide was low, all the water would go out to here. So you'd be on the beach in this resort, and then the water would actually disappear. Uh, and so we thought it would be interesting to kind of create this, this walkway. Uh, you can see here the, the building from, from the outside. It becomes a, a wall, and within the wall becomes everything else in the resort. So it's like this idea of, of creating a context, of creating... Uh, some uh, parameters for us to engage with. And it's actually also in, in the Middle East, so this is like a, a crescent moon, uh, which is a, a very powerful symbol there. And the wall, when approached, is, is something very, very powerful, very, very mystical. The scale, we like to play around a lot with scale and, and texture and material. You can see these sort of carvings, almost like a, an alien uh, race that created this thing, something very otherworldly. Once again, preserving the environment outside in its natural state and then creating this incredible oasis uh, within the walls and creating these incredible moments of delight where you have, in a very harsh environment, a very luscious uh, experience. Because it, it does rain in, in these areas, but it's about how you collect that water and how you let that water become part of the environment. And this is the, the path that goes out to the extended beach. You can see here just creating these very intimate moments of experience. Um, we also created this notion of a crater on top of a mountain. This is a project in Utah. And it sits um, at the top of a, of a ski mountain with views in all directions. You can actually see four states uh, from the area. And we were inspired again by, by the work of James Terrell. This is apparently, as I understand it, the largest artwork that has ever existed in humankind. James Terrell has been working on this for over 30 years. He bought a crater and is actually sculpting the crater. So uh, uh, you can see parts of this here, but he's been shaping this crater for, for 30 years. Uh, basically, all the money he makes in his artwork goes into actually creating this largest work of art. So in our instance, uh, ours is a little smaller, uh, we have a little crater here, and inside is the garden, and outside uh, is more of the, the wild nature. And we tried to create something that would sort of track the passage of the sun. You can see here uh, the building on this very angled slope, uh, basically creating a, a framing device 
uh, for this incredible horizon of mountains and sky. And here you can see the forest contained within this courtyard. Once again, very, very classical uh, in nature. And then the fireplace becoming sort of a center of life uh, within this resort. Another desert project that we've been very moved by uh, is a project that we've been working on in Wadi Rum, which is in Jordan. Um, it's kind of a very exciting area here. You can see Jordan. Here's our site. Petra, the ancient city of Petra, Dead Sea, Israel. And then just zooming in a little bit, you can begin to see the sort of incredible nature of our site. Our clients spent eight years collecting and negotiating with Bedouin tribal leaders to get this site. Uh, basically, uh, you know, a third of her life at the time. Um, and the task was to, how to create a, she asked us, you know, we want to create a resort here. And we immediately felt that we couldn't just build a building on the land. You know, everything was here. It's the most dramatic and beautiful nature you've ever seen. It's actually where they filmed the movie The Martian with Matt Damon, and they didn't use any special effects. I mean, this is all here. He was just living out there as if he was, you know, millions of miles away. Uh, but it's an incredibly powerful landscape, and we wanted to create something that was, once again, invisible and more in tune. We oftentimes begin by by diagramming all the life that exists on the site. So this is a little drawing that we do of the flora and the fauna. We also like to understand, as I mentioned before, the history of civilization. How did people live there? How, what were the people doing? What type of culture is there? We really want to, to get into their, their minds and understand how they worked and how they lived and how they ate and how they celebrated because we want our architecture to really be of the spirit of that place. So we really do a deep dive and become very close, sometimes a, a bit too close. Uh, this is one of the tribal leaders, uh, grew a little fond of me. Uh, but you know, you don't want to be out there and insulting anyone, so uh, went along with that. Um, this is uh, a gaming engine. So oftentimes we're using gaming technology because the buildings and the landscapes are one, we're able to use gaming engines to kind of better understand atmosphere uh, and environment to really craft the design. These are some of the spa villas that existed outside the site, which are actually rammed earth. So we took the sand and mixed it with cement and, and made these walls. But everything was there for us. We just needed to open our eyes and become sensitive to it. So this is a picture from ancient Petra. And you can see the incredible beauty in the place. It, it was an idea of, of architecture that was more subtractive rather than additive. We wanted to bring in as few materials as possible and really carve and sculpt the land in a way of a land artist rather than an architect. And another artist that I've always been interested in is the, the artist Michael Heitzer. He also is building another, maybe it's the second largest work of art ever in Nevada, uh, where he's carving into the rock and creating these incredible moments. So the project is based of different areas, a welcome area, a spa lodge, tentlet, rock lodge, and, and a reserve. And each one of these, we can go into a little bit more detail. Uh, it takes about six hours to walk around the site uh, in desert heat. It takes about two hours by camel. Uh, camels are a bit more difficult to ride than they look. Uh, they pop around quite a bit. Uh, this is the, the welcome area where you actually get on your camel to go uh, to your room. Uh, and the architecture is very, very essential. It's just actually a, a rectilinear courtyard. And the way that the courtyard frames and celebrates the sky and the mountains, it becomes an incredibly heightened experience. But you can see the architecture is, is very, very simple. And I, I do really emphasize the fact that we strongly believe that everything could be as simple as possible and still have an incredibly dynamic experience. If you go over to the tent area, um, we wanted to create these tents utilizing the technology that the Bedouins have used for thousands and thousands of years. So 
tents are essentially lofts. They're big open space with all these different components, so bathroom, living room, bedroom, all in one. Uh, these are some of the drawings that we did for the project to understand the scale of these buildings in the landscape. And the tents we did were, were actually tents that were using the, the techniques of the Bedouin, the idea that they weave from their goats uh, these tents made out of the goat hair, and which are incredibly high-tech, if you think about it, because they're woven, which allows the air to kind of circulate. And then if it rains, which it actually does occasionally, the hair expands and actually becomes a waterproof layer. So very, very interesting how to kind of dive back into these highly primitive techniques and do things in a, in a very smart way. We also didn't want to use electricity. We wanted people to, to really get there and disconnect from everything. Uh, we didn't want to have like World Cup playing on the TV in, in one of the rooms. So we really wanted people to, to feel the silence. Uh, oftentimes we go out to these sites and we camp there. I spent many nights here in the desert. And one of the things that's so interesting is the silence you start to hear everything. And there's very little life that's kind of squirming around. But the silence is something very, very interesting. You don't hear planes. You don't hear cars. It's incredible how amplified your, your senses get when there's no sounds to distract you. Another component here uh, was an area that we wanted to be built into the cliff. There were these incredible cliff faces, and this area looks over the sunset. And we begin to see how these elements could be integrated uh, into this rock face. And the idea was to, to kind of build into the geometry where the building would be invisible during the day, hidden in the shadows. And at night, you begin to see how these elements become uh, part of, of the geology and the geometry of the rock. And these are the layouts of the rooms showing the rock carving into those spaces as you can see here, both on this mesa and below. The hardest part on this project was trying to figure out where to build because it was so overwhelmingly large. But the idea of creating this sort of future primitive space, these uh, modern or contemporary cave dwellings, um, are something really very, very unique. And everything has been reductive and subtractive from the space. We didn't want to create and add things and bring things like bring in a bathtub from Italy or something. So the bathtub is like carved out of the rock. Everything is carved out of the rock. And the idea is that there's no climate control. So the resort is closed you know, for two months in the height of summer and two months in winter. But we're able to create something that is, is very, very pure and very, very powerful in a time when everyone is getting more technological. We believe that we can get more connection to places and more kind of beauty out of doing something that is very, very simple. So those elements that you saw before, those rammed earth walls, actually exist here. And the, the walls actually protect from the space. And then the spa and the wellness area is kind of carved into like this little nook. And you walk up there in this sort of pathway at night. And when you get there, you have all these series of chambers and rooms that have been carved out of the rock, similar to the way the Nebataeans did 2,300 years ago when they built Petra. But the experience is something very different because before everything was about controlling nature. Here we're allowing nature and the beauty of, of what's out there to come in. And the water is something very interesting as well. The Nebataeans figured out with very simple technology how to channel this water into cisterns. So we created a series of cisterns that become experiential chambers uh, for the spa. I had the opportunity of living in, in Rome and always been inspired by the, the Parthenon and uh, Pantheon, I'm sorry, I always confuse the two. And just the idea of this oculus and the way that light can track the passage of time. Here you can see those spa suites that was in between the walls that you saw before in the, in the gaming technology. And then the walls are backed up to the rock and create these private realms. And the overall experience is something like this. So the rock walls are actually the same composition of the rock of the, the, the desert around it. And it creates these very, very private and intimate experiences that are blended and part of the environment. So once again, doing less with more. So it's just two walls. And the walls actually block the sun. So you have this kind of glass uh, enclosure, but the walls are creating 
this presentation of the sun and the passage of the time. And then the final component was a, a reserve lodge. This was the idea of doing one singular structure. And the, the idea was to follow the, 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 the sort of geology of the site. And in this case, you could see here this structure that kind of exists that's just following the space of the building. And here you can see the rocks and the other structures that become the elements that hold up this building, framing these views of the surrounding landscape and here cascading pools, creating this beautiful experience. We also wanted to do something more, create like an entire ecosystem. So in this case, we developed an entire series of, of farming and a whole idea of, of, a, of a permaculture. So creating this beautiful gardens uh, with a, an incredible landscape architect out of, out of Miami and a series of irrigation and channels that would begin to create all the food that was required for this resort. The other thing that we did was we didn't want to just create some place where foreigners can come in and enjoy. We wanted to create something that was more connected uh, to the, the overall ecosystem of the place. So this was a village that was nearby of Bedouin people, sort of a depressed uh, area. And we decided that the first thing we would do would build a, a craft, an art school, to reteach the tribal people all these incredible techniques that they had. And we would use those elements of, of, of craft within the project itself. So everything would be made locally by the local people. And little by little, the artist village would begin to grow and grow and grow. So the idea is that we would actually create an incredible environment for the people as well. And the last thing that we did was designed a, a very uh, custom-made Najwa walking stick uh, with a lot of interesting technology. Uh, very nearby, uh, we're working on a project um, at the tip of the Red Sea, kind of a very important place. Uh, this is where Moses uh, supposedly crossed uh, as the Israelites were being chased by the Egyptians. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Israelites sort of went the wrong way. They should have gone that way and would have been there in probably about five days instead of that. They went through here and Took them 50 years to to find Israel, um, but you know they made it. And uh, here we could see Charlton Heston actually acting as Moses. He has his Najwa staff in his hand. Um, but the idea of him supposedly manipulating the materials of nature to to create something. So here you can see some incredible 1970s special effects. Um, where he's parting the Red Sea and everyone's fleeing to safety. Very powerful. So we thought that, you know, if Moses could kind of manipulate nature, uh, you know, maybe we can as well. So uh, we thought, you know, maybe we could do it with sand. So this is our project over here. It's actually very close. Uh, to Israel. Um, you can literally throw a, a stone from our site uh, to Israel, but you might not want to do that because those guys don't take well to stone throwing, as we, we know uh, in the media. Um, so our idea was, um, the, this is a big resort. It's actually the largest project in Jordan. It's the same client from the previous project. Uh, and our task was to design a clubhouse. And the client wanted to do a, something iconic, which is kind of a scary word for us because we're always trying to create something silent and invisible but powerful. So we ended up with a, a bit of a compromise. Uh, what's interesting to us is obviously the surroundings and the beauty of, of nature. And, and we thought, you know, this is really what the project wants to be. And we got on site and we saw this. Um, and we're like, okay, we're done here. This is it. We want to create this occupiable dune. So it took a little bit of a longer time, but this is an overall site plan here. This is the building itself. Uh, and to occupy a, a, a dune is uh, surprisingly more complex than it sounds. Uh, we had some incredible engineers out of Switzerland 
um, helping us craft uh, the engineering behind this. Here you can see some 3D models uh, from the, the computer. Uh, and then some of the drawings of these very, very organic shapes uh, that begin to evolve from that dune landscape. Um, this is the arrival area. So essentially the dune has sort of been sculpted in and lifted as if you were almost playing on the beach uh, with sand as, as a child. Uh, and the geometry uh, is sort of evolved from the landscape itself. Here you can see a section through the building and the section uh, through the transverse site as well. So it becomes this very interesting notion of arches, of ways of, of kind of framing and viewing the site. Uh, you enter uh, back over here through that, that sort of lip, as you see here. Um, and then you're confronted with this incredible valley view uh, of the Red Sea. Uh, you can see here a little bit more detail, uh, cars arriving. But the architecture is something very raw, very, very primitive. It's, it's a mixture, once again, of the local sand, of local materials crystallized into this form. And there's no columns in the space. The architecture and structure and, are, are one, and we think it's something very, very pure uh, in that um, experience. And then you can see here over the Red Sea, this is a, a lounge area. And then framing views of the surrounding landscape. And even the floor itself is, is once again the same mixture of the sand and the cement. So it becomes sort of one uh, underlying environment that helps you and frame views of the of the landscape and being very very powerful and dynamic in scale um, doing that is is actually quite easy in terms of construction although no one knew how to do this uh, before in this area so we brought in some some Swiss guys uh, if you ever need a job done you got to call the Swiss that's why we have our office in Switzerland, uh, and these two guys in orange uh, taught these Bedouin people how to build this thing with no equipment. Everything is, is sort of done by hand. The one piece of machinery that we did bring in, actually from Turkey, was a way of, of pumping the cement uh, into the project itself. So the Swiss guy, you know, there was a tremendous language barrier. No one spoke each other's language. Uh, but it was it's very sort of simple, sort of master and apprentice way. So very simple forms, very simple techniques of bringing this thing together, very, very crude. So this is actually a, a, a very low-cost building uh, that looks very dynamic and, and seemingly harder to build than it is. So here you can begin to see uh, the cladding and the mesh that will capture the cement. And once again, a sort of very handmade uh, experience. Uh, you can begin to see you know, the, the beautiful techniques of holding up this structure. And you know, very, very um, simple. This was actually not a machine for us. It was something more of the grading. But you can see the, the building, how it begins to come out of the ground. And then here you can see the, the one piece of machinery had, the, the pump for for the cement and how this building begins to emerge and become one. This is um, the technique of building was actually something very thoughtful as well. We brought in the Swiss team to teach them on the smaller structure that was built. Uh, and then they were basically there the entire time. And then the next structure that we're building is something a little larger. Uh, and the Swiss people would come to visit uh, occasionally, maybe every other week. And then the last building, which was the one you saw uh, prior, that would be built um, by the people uh, by themselves. Only trouble with that plan is our client decided to not use the people who learned the technique uh, and hired a whole other crew, uh, which was not part of our plan. Uh, but you know, things get pretty crazy out there. Um, and you'll see in a moment. So here you can see the, the building really blending uh, with the surroundings and also the roughness of it. It's like as if the, the sand of the desert solidified and became the structure. Uh, this is Bayat testing out the structural load uh, of the site. Uh, and this is an artist that the client actually brought in to help kind of 
pigmentize the buildings with the local minerals. And you'll see in a moment, this is uh, the artist. He actually probably never changed his clothes uh, in the time that we ever, and he lived in here. Um, and he's actually a tremendous genius. And um, he's basically taking all of the minerals from the desert and mixing them and has this incredible technique where he's starting to like throw the pigments and wash the pigments. You'll see here in a moment his very scientific technique. <laughs> so the beauty of this technique is that you get something very, very unique. The challenge is that you can never get it again. So if you see something you like, well, that's pretty much it. You'll never get that same technique again. Um, there was a lot of fighting going on, a lot of Arabic being spoken. Uh, we're not sure how he'll survive because he's inhaling all these incredible minerals at all times. But the richness and the depth of, of these local minerals being integrated into the building. So... He has a little bit of uh, phosphorus in his hand, uh, which is an explosive material. Um, so I don't know, uh, Bayad, I guess, was filming this. He was very, very brave uh, because he actually has a, a lighter and a cigarette, lit cigarette, um, at the same time of his hand being coated in a highly explosive material. Um, but there was a lot of heated debates going on. As you can see, the longer he stayed there, the more coded he became like the project in and of himself. But at the end of the day, he is a genius. This is actually gold dust, local gold being blown onto the site. Uh, so, you know, what we go through for the poetry of the project. But you get this very lustrous and, and incredibly powerful materiality and richness of texture uh, that captures the light and in, in a very, very beautiful way, framing uh, using very Islamic techniques of, of light manipulation. And then here you can see that first structure kind of emerging out of the landscape, becoming part of the landscape. Um, and this is actually... Probably the nicest bathroom that we've ever designed. That's essentially what that is. It's a comfort station with a little lounge. And, but here you can see the, the artistry and the craft. Um, they actually put these screens in upside down. We had to actually rotate them. So it's quite fascinating to work around the world with all these different um, people and all these different craftsmen. And that's one of the great challenges of, of doing what we're doing. And here you can see some more of that, that detail and that richness. Uh, and then the final um, project, not the final, but the second one that they're doing, this is the one that's actually completed now. Uh, this is the academy, so it's a, a school for, for golf. And here you can see the structure as it was in construction. We're actually awaiting plans for the final uh, photographs. Um, they haven't done a great job at photographing them but you can begin to see that, that same technique and even the water is following that uh, beautiful structure. Uh, which brings me to the, the last um, project. Uh, this is a, actually not our project, but it's uh, our, our canvas, if you will. Um, this is an interesting diagram that, that we found. This is all of the water on our planet. Um, I never really saw this before. I was at a lecture and I saw that. I was like, ah, that's a joke. There's no way. Um, some of these oceans are thousands of miles uh, deep. Uh, but in fact, you know, this is all the water on our planet. And then all of the drinking water is that little dot over Atlanta. Um, so the idea of, of, of water and, and the use of water is something really critical these days. Um, we were asked by the, the city of, of Basel in Switzerland and, and the township of the Muttens to uh, create a drinking water facility that took the water of the Rhine River and turned it into the most delicious drinking water that you could possibly find. 
Um, so imagine your Danube River here being able to, to drink from it. Um, the project existed at a very interesting intersection between the industrial park area, Basel is a very industrial area, and the forest here, which is preserved and, and sacred in the area. Uh, our project was at the cusp between the two. Here you can see a little bit of closer up on a highway as well as a, a new railroad uh, track that was going in. Um, it was an infrastructure project, and um, we were a little bit of outsiders, and we were under a tremendous amount of scrutiny um, because there was no budget to do any architecture. Um, we began to try to figure out a way to, to take this box, which essentially was our part of the design because all the technical was um, done by engineers, and turn that into something that, that was of interest. So we began to, to see, like, well, what if we bury that box and put a, a water pond sitting along the highway uh, that would be kind of very dynamic at night and sort of this mystical quality to it? And they said, no, you can't, can't bury it. We're like, well, what about could we bring the earth up and, and hide the building uh, underneath a, a berm and, and cut in some very strategic windows that would make this thing highly mysterious. And they're like, well, no, you can't do that either. So uh, we're running out of ideas. Um, and we began to study different shapes and forms and you know, what could this volume be? And everything to us felt arbitrary. We're like, why would it be this form over that form or that form over this form? And, and we really hate arbitrary form generation. And we began to think, like, well, what could give us a form for this building? And we thought, well, the only thing that, that we can do is what if we suck all the extra volume out of the building that was around this technical equipment and made the building about the most efficient way of, of kind of volumetrically and uh, spatially around that. So we, we began to to run simulations on the computer about all these forces of, of sucking the air out of the work. We actually saw a piece of art um, from a, a local artist actually in Switzerland who took these very pure, almost like Donald Judd boxes and sucked the air out. So we asked him, like, would you want to do this project with us? He said, no. So uh, we're like, all right, well, we're going to suck, suck the air out of this one ourselves. Um, so here you can see sort of different iterations of, of what that could be. Uh, and we, we thought that was kind of interesting, but we, we were like, well, you know, what could this be made out of? And we began to research the history of, of water and vessels of, that held water. And we began to realize that it, there was actually clay that were the original vessels of water. So we're like, okay, let's do something out of clay. And Bayat was like, wait a minute. There's a little place when I was a kid, I used to play up in the forest and got clay. So we grabbed Bayot's kids' bikes, one of his kids here tonight, and we rode up into the woods on these little kid bikes and went to the, the clay pit of his childhood and began to extract the, the clay and the earth of the city that we're building the structure in. And uh, then came back and from the techniques that we learned from the computer simulations, made a little clay model uh, that was following the sort of forms of the sort of simulated con um, suction of the building. And then from there, began to, to draw it up. Well, first of all, we like presented it to the city. We couldn't believe that they would accept such a thing. Uh, but we wanted the, this to be more... Uh, geology than architecture, more like a part of the forest, like a, a rock wall or a face. So you can see here the technique of drawing this thing um, was, was very critical in its understanding. And then the building sort of manipulates and does different things that are highly unusual uh, for a structure, an industrial structure. But it really becomes part of the forest. So here you can see the technical 
um, factory and then the entry and the celebration of water. Uh, we convinced the city to, to put like a little public area uh, in the facility itself so people can get connected. And then as you approach the building, it feels like something that's more part of nature than part of the industrial park that exists. But yet it obviously is a building, and you can begin to see some of these things as it emerge from the forest. And building this building, remember, we couldn't spend a dollar more or a euro more than what would be building the most simple shed of the structure. So we had to get really innovative and come up with a way to generate this form for the cost of just doing the most simple, cheapest box. So we end up using a, a similar technique of, of the sprayed-on cement. Uh, this building has actually turned out to be the largest shotcrete building uh, ever done by man, which was not our intent. Uh, but it's kind of been uh, very important uh, for that industry. And here you can see them starting to um, spray on this, this material, um, which created a, something really quite beautiful within the forest. Remember, it's kind of the clay technique, so it's uh, something that exists on the edge of the forest. It's a technical building, but yet it's really very much a, a part of the landscape, and you can begin to see this mysterious building and the highly you know, rich and tactile quality of it that really speaks of the materiality of, of the forest and the mist and becomes kind of ver something very, very poetic where it could have been something very, very industrial. So here you can see this technique and, and hopefully that the building will, will kind of be covered with moss and become more emerged in the forest. Um, we had a little unfortunate situation where the minute the building was done, the forest actually around the building got cut down, which was a little disturbing. So now we have actually little oak trees that are that high instead of this beautiful forest that it once existed in. So um, this is actually looking back. But you get these really interesting crevasses that were generated from the drying of the clay uh, and then using that to scan it into a 3D experience. Um, this is a, a movie that... Uh, Bayat's son actually did. He's here, guest uh, cinematographer and director. Leon, hello. So, um, as was mentioned before, we um, finally, after many years, um, put together a book of, of some of the work. Uh, we're going to donate this copy here to the center, which I'm uh, very impressed with. This is a really beautiful facility. Um, but the book is able to be ordered. It was actually uh, handmade uh, in Holland by an incredible printer. It has a very unique way of, of opening up and, and laying flat, and please feel free to, to look around the, building, uh, the book. It's, uh, we tried to make the book uh, the pure expression of, of the architecture as well, something very, very simple. Uh, and all the 
proceeds for the book actually go to Oceana, uh, which is a, um, an organization, a philanthropic organization that helps protect our oceans. So, you know, in closing, I just wanted to hope that um, I was able to inspire some new ways of, of thinking about the way that we can build more with the land uh, rather than merely on the land and get a new appreciation for, for the beauty of, of the world around us. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. All right. So I have a... Thank you very much, Chad, you. for the... Uh, such an inspiring uh, lecture. And uh, before I open the floor to discussions, uh, to questions, uh, I have one for you. Yes. Uh, obviously, you've uh, you work with a lot of local materials, mm -hmm. and we saw that. But uh, and you touched upon this a little bit. How how much do you actually work with the local communities as well? Uh, is that something that's important to you? Yeah. No. Definitely. I mean, oftentimes we're we're also utilizing not only local materials but the local techniques and the local strengths of the, the people. And, and I think that's what, what gives the project its local flavor. Um, you know, it's very important for us. I mean, of course, not everything can be local in every condition, but it's very important for us to, to kind of utilize the, the, the local craft and the local techniques and, and, and search for it and sometimes teach the local people things that they may have, have forgotten. So it's something very important for sure. And uh, I guess the next question is a bit more with uh, the, some of the earlier projects that you showed us, because uh -huh. you, you, you worked or you work with, uh, within quite a sort of luxurious realm of architecture. Yeah. And, but then, of course, you, you care about you know, sustainability quite a lot. So do you th have you ever felt there's sort of an ambiguity or a paradox sometimes before between how you want the building to be and sort of the clients as well, which might not have such a sustainable lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And, and it's interesting because, you know, in this presentation, I, I showed just more of the projects that are meaningful for me in terms of this idea of, of connecting to place and connecting to, to the spirit. But we do that in many different instances and in urban projects and other things, master planning, um, you know, but yes, there is a, a certain luxurious aspect to it. But, you know, interestingly enough, m many of the things aren't expensive. So to carve into the rock is cheaper than to bring materials from outside. Um, the building of the water treatment plant also was the most economical thing that, that we possibly uh, can do. So it is a definite paradox of, of, of getting the clients um, to follow that way. We, we did a, a design of a city in, in the Middle East where it was all about actually building more nature. And we, we argued with them that if we create the most incredible habitat for the birds and the bees and the flora and the fauna, that it would actually provide the most incredible habitat for our species as well. So you have to sort of get people uh, along those lines. But yes, it's an interesting dialogue. Right. All right, I'm sure you have some questions. I have this yeah. throwing microphone, which I'm going <laughs> to chuck at you, or Never maybe chat will throw like at that. you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, who's going to go first? Any questions? <laughs> I've never seen that before. I don't need uh, the microphone. Oh, that's perfect. You, what did you show uh, uh, our uh, memories about uh, Atlantis? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a message for ET? <laughs> I love ET. <laughs> uh, the uh, Sardinia and uh, the rest of uh, Atlantis is uh -huh. very close to your work. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So that's more, more uh, a comment on uh, the <laughs> utopian uh, yeah. aspect. Well, of it's interesting because um, at the um, at the opening of that house for the movie director, you speak about ET. Um, I ended up. Uh, jumping in on a, a tour with Michael and Steven Spielberg, who made E.T., and uh, I, I was very pleased that he, Steven Spielberg, was like, I've never seen anything like this. So, you know, as a child, seeing his movies, it was uh, always like, ah, you know, and then he did the same thing when he saw our work, so that was really meaningful. But, yeah, they, they actually think that Atlantis is very close to that 
area in the Bahamas, actually. There's like supposedly 50 miles from Miami, there's an island in the Bahamas called Bimini, and they say that that's Atlantis is, is down there. So come visit. <laughs> Have you talked to George Lucas about uh, the next Star Wars? No. Are we going to no. see any of your stuff uh, there? I no. wish. I, I, although we might be designing some sets for Michael's new movie, actually. It's uh, in the works. So, is cool. yeah. so uh, another question from the audience? Uh, that's the coolest thing. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you. The, I think the presentation was breathtaking. Oh, and I'm not just saying for myself. So um, I wanted to ask um, which place or like piece of art or anything took your bread away last time, if it's still happening. Yeah. Um, you know, funny enough, I was just talking to, to Bayad that I'd never been here before and I literally just arrived like an hour before the lecture and I was, it's such an incredibly beautiful city and uh, you guys probably <laughs> take it for granted because you're here all the time, but... Uh, you know, that's as a as a foreigner to most of the places that we work. I think it's interesting to see things with a, a new set of eyes. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, which is certainly not the paradise of many of these places. And uh, you know, living in Miami, I, I kind of came there uh, with a new set of eyes and saw things that mm -hmm. people hadn't seen. And I didn't show our work in Miami, but you can see it online. But um, but for me, it's, it's always interesting to see the beauty in, in everything. You know, it's always about like finding the beauty. And, and I, I mean, just driving here from the hotel and seeing the way that the land connects to the water and the building. I mean, it's incredibly. So I would say that it was Prague that just did that yeah. to me. <laughs> I, I, I can believe and I can agree. Uh, yeah. One more uh, little question. Uh, is there something on your to travel list you would like to visit, you would, you would like to see? To, somewhere to travel? Yeah. Um, yeah there, Where you would it, like to go, like, next? Well, this was on my list, so I did check this off today. Um, where else? I was just thinking about going. Well, I, I, I've been somewhere recently that I had been before that I find really beautiful. And, um, and I guess that was also, like, uh, almost a uh, religious experience, if you will, this I, idea of... Uh, incredible beauty and nature. Um, I had the opportunity to go uh, heli skiing in Iceland a couple of months back. So it was like, I, I just were like going down the hill, like singing like, like, you know, religious songs and I'm not a religious person, but it was like, you know, God is great. And you know, ah. I, it was like a really moving experience just being out there in this incredible nature. So for me, it's, um, you know, it's always a struggle actually to when people bring us to these incredible sites and say, like, we want to do this building, I'm always like, ah, no, like, I don't want to do a building. Let's just keep it like this. So it's a interesting, but then we wouldn't really be in business and someone else would do the project. So uh, that wouldn't be good either. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, conversation of how to do things in these very uh, beautiful places where we don't want to ruin them. We want to actually make them more of what they were before. So, okay. thank you. Thank yeah. you. But now that you mentioned Iceland, you, you've done a lot of work in the sand, but ha have you done anything in the snow? No, but, well, projects that have a lot of snow, um, like in the mountains and Colorado, and but I would love to do something in Iceland, for sure. All right, uh, another question? That's a long that's throw. A, that's a tough one. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to get hurt on this one. Ah! Oh. Almost. <laughs> uh, thank you for a great lecture. Yeah. I wanted to ask, you were talking a lot about uh, gathering the inspiration from the nature that is surround, surrounding your projects. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a bit more on the analysis and the inspiration in urban projects you do? Like yeah. Like in uh, more yeah. in the city? For sure. Um, actually, we got our start doing urban projects. Um, and we still do them, so, um, but, um, you know, f our, a lot of our urban projects, um, we'll talk about architecture, I guess, rather than urban planning, because we, we do planning as well. Um, and for me, I, I think, well, I'll talk about planning for a moment, just because we mentioned it, but to me, I, I, I think I, I learn a lot from old cities. And I, I think what's interesting about planning 
uh, is that many times modern day planning seems to be uh, designed for like modern day life. Like uh, I remember we were doing this project in Abu Dhabi where we were designing a city and uh, for 150,000 people and, and this is the one where we wanted to create more nature. And what was interesting is we, we wanted the, the urban areas to be very, very dense, you know, like a traditional way of, similar to the way the older towns are. And all the engineers who were designing the roads, they were like, ah, no way. You have to design with a radius for the car. And the, so when the car becomes the, the center of design, I, I think things become very complex. So we're, we're always trying to deal with the, the human condition and the human experience as the sort of uh, guiding principle. Um, in terms of architecture in an urban setting, um, many of our w work in the beginning was in Miami, and um, many of the projects um, kind of go by this feeling that we have that, in a way, buildings look better under construction than completed. Um, it, with, with that, I mean that there, there's sort of a purity to a building when it becomes just slab and structure and things like that. And oftentimes I'm driving around cities or in Miami in particular and you see a building and you're like, wow, that's really cool. It's like just a, what's there, the essence of what's there. So the same idea of how we do these projects are reducing everything down to its essence in a way like cooking where you make a reduction and by taking out all the extraneous elements like water, you get a more potent flavor. Um, that's similar to what we've done in our building. So the way we design like a high rise or a smaller building is like we're always thinking about how does the structure work? How do you design the, the rooms and the, the, the residences so that they're maximizing views of a good thing? So uh, everything is, is with a reason. Every line drawn and everything is always about optimizing the experience and in, in the case of a, of a building it's like if let's say there's an incredible view in one direction and a bad view in another how do you get every unit to face that view or even if it creates something unusual that's sort of the way that, that we think and um, and it's this fully integrated architecture and structure there's nothing that could be removed um, because Developers, especially in Miami, tend to be economical about how they want to build, and uh, we don't want anything taken away. So we've removed everything from this. But there's tremendous amount of beauty everywhere. Um, you know, I, in particular, these projects in Miami. You know, it's just structure and glass, and um, you really get connected to the surroundings. Something here urbanistically, um, you know, projects in Switzerland in the urban center that we're doing. Also, try to using like local techniques, old buildings, scale, proportion, things that um, we find that are timeless. I, I think uh, I just have a hard time um, getting connected to fad and style. And um, while we use the computer, religiously and have all the technology of modeling and renderings and things like that. We, we try not to let the computer kind of generate the form. You know, we would try to you know, come more from the heart in a way than, than the mind. So um, harder to explain without images, but that's kind of the focus. But we are trying to bring that nature in in the city uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. Is there anyone else? There's someone in the back, so you can just that's love easy. it. That's okay. quite easy. I think it picks up great sound. It's like unbelievable. I have a practical question, like technical. Oh, yes. I'm not um, the practical person, so you know, some <laughs> other people no, might I'll have to try. answer. Um, the huge building, the, the one, the, the big triangle, I think mm -hmm. it was in Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of source of energy uses? Like, if you design your own source of energy or it's kind of connected to some kind of general, I don't know, diesel energy sources, I, don't, I have no idea, but it's a, a huge building question. and I, was, yeah. I would be curious about how to maintain the building. It's a good, good question. I mean, we're imagining actually like solar on the roof, but the solar doesn't work that well that's, with the sand. I... Yeah, with the sand. But unfortunately, that project never got that far, so uh -huh. I don't have the answer. Um, 
But the other project didn't use power. That project took an untimely death um, when uh, like the, the queen's son took over. And unfortunately, like the that project- That was my second question, if any of those projects are going any further. Yeah, I mean, all of like, well, I don't know if you could tell the difference between rent, some of the renderings and some of the yeah, well. reality. They're kind of uh, intentionally deceptive. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say like, um, well, the project in Jordan is actually under construction. Two of the structures are, are built. Um, the other project in Jordan ran into a, an issue um, during construction where the local tribes wanted to get more money. And uh, it was happening during Arab Spring. And uh, so they were barricading the project. Uh, these are things that they don't teach you really in architecture school that you have to deal with uh, like geopolitical uh, uprisings and other things. So, um, and then the Qatar project, you know, is on permanent hold, uh, but everything else was but, uh, built. But also, how, how about the villa of Michael Bay? And, that's uh, built. And the, the, oh, that's no, built. but uh, I mean the, um, the power? swimming pool, the swimming pool that is 80 yeah. meter long, like I would be curious how yeah. the technology well, is working. Funny enough that we actually proposed solar hot water for Michael, and uh, he, Michael's like a very practical person, actually, and he's like, okay, well, I'm gonna pay this much for the solar hot water, and he asked every engineer to do a, uh, like a life cycle analysis on like solar panels and this, that, and what have you. And, and actually, California has pretty high, it's actually the most energy efficient codes in the United States, because people there are in love with uh, the environment. And Michael was like, okay, solar panels, okay, you're gonna get the payback in 25 years. Like, am I gonna do this now? Because those panels are never gonna last 25 years. I mean, it's kind of stuff where like, oh my God, you know, please just put the solar panel, you know, like you can afford it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting dialogue because um, there's nothing sustainable about designing such a large home for a, That's one person. That's what I was wondering, if, yeah. if it's possible. But no, I mean, even if you did, it's like, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, you know, it's like you're never going to, to uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we're always torn between, we always propose everything and design everything and then not everything comes to our um, uh, completion. And, you know, it's definitely a, a struggle between getting the opportunity to do a, a house like that and then realizing, like, it's probably not the greatest thing for sustainability. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, but we try to do the best we can do. And, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to it, but uh, I guess if I didn't do these projects, someone else would. And maybe it would have more fun than I did doing it. Uh, so, but it's definitely an interesting dialogue on all these things. You know, it's like the water treatment in um, Basel. Um, you know, it's it's something that's very good for the city to produce its own water. It does require energy, but a lot of energy in Switzerland is is green, um, and it's something that I think we are all going to need to deal. That's not us. That's, that's not us cutting you off, you know. <laughs> no. Uh, one last question from the audience, and then we have to go. So, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. So I have a short question. How hard is it to sell your? ideas because if you're working for somebody who can afford to buy a piece of desert or is a queen and this type of person are not really used to hear no or what they should do and you still you're probably able to sell your ideas which are not really conventional
religious. Yeah, uh, you know, religious leaders of, of these ideas. Um, and I think it's, it's really important for me that um, I don't sell anything. Um, I just am really impassioned. Like when, I, when we come up with something like that, like that's the magic moment. And, and for me, like, and I, I get the opportunity to present most of the time to clients. And um, for me, I, I, I don't know, I, I guess they, they see how much I believe in what we're doing. Like, and, and that's, you know, I didn't show you the process on, on every project, but every project goes through this really arduous process that in a way proves to us that that's the best solution for the task at hand. Um, you know, one could argue like, why do a spa in the middle of the desert anyway? But once you get the, the program, and the, the, the mission, if you will, we have to prove to ourselves that that's the best way. And so therefore, once we prove it to ourselves, it's kind of easy to prove it to the clients um, because we believe it so much, you know, that we've, we've exhausted everything. And whether that's true or not, we, we believe it. So it's uh, at any point, uh, you have to believe in something. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to deal with clients, and we deal with clients all around the world, in Europe, Middle East, Asia, United States, private clients, public clients. Uh, there's certainly uh, an artistry in dealing with that, and uh, the good news is, like, at some point I'm able to hand off the project to the team of ambassadors and diplomats because I, I don't handle well um, necessarily um, having to modify things uh, too much. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I do believe that it's the client's um, money, so it's our responsibility to do what they, they need, but um, we're very impassioned about it and we'll uh, definitely explain our point of view. But at the end of the day, clients are always right, and uh, we, uh, we respect their position. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting field as an architect to negotiate between desires of, of yourself and, and your clients. But the good news is that most of our clients come to us because they believe in what we can do for them. So it's not really like uh, much of a mission uh, once we've proved to ourselves what it is. But we've had some very interesting debates. Like I, I think of designing Michael's home. Michael's a very strong-willed person. And uh, we had some, we took a few issues to the mat, you know. Like, so it's kind of a funny experience. Uh, but almost literally to the mat, you know. Um, but at any rate, it, uh, it was all good. All good, but uh, it's definitely an interesting process to collaborate with our clients, for sure. So, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of our lecture today. If you want to hear some great stories about Michael Bay and then and, uh, chat fighting, you can uh, catch him here in, in a little bit. So, thank you very much, Chet Oppenheim. Thank you.